Um, If you're just joining us, we're in the book of Ephesians, which is a letter in the New Testament um, that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. We start, uh, we're in chapter four. Um, This week, we're talking about some really practical things, some very important things that reminded me of, of, um, of a, of a lizard, actually. It reminded me of a chameleon. And uh, y'all, y'all know what a chameleon is, right? A chameleon is a, is a type of lizard that can change its colors depending on the environment that it's in. It becomes like what it is in the environment, and it does that as a way to protect itself. It's kind of a, 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 an amazing feature that, it, that it, it, it can blend in and be camouflaged uh, from danger, from predators that are there. And I was thinking this week, you know, um, a chameleon lizard, that's pretty cool. A chameleon Christian, not so much. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is going to talk about today in our passage of, of how it's real easy for us to kind of want to blend in to our environment and the culture and not stand out too much and be different. Listen to me, students, young people, as you're getting ready to go back to school in a couple of weeks, the pressure that is there, I know, to, to kind of blend in and fit in. Um, this passage is for you here today. And, and a lot of times, you know, not, not just young people, adults feel that pressure too. Maybe not the same way you felt peer pressure when you were 14, but, but there certainly is a, a, a pressure that comes in and a desire to kind of be successful in the world's eyes. And, and sometimes we say things, maybe we think it or maybe we say it out loud well, when it comes to kind of blending in. It's like, well, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to be culturally relevant. I'm trying to kind of connect with the culture. Um, and, uh, and then we, we, we say, well, isn't that what Jesus did? Jesus came and he hung out with the sinners and the tax collectors, so much so that people even labeled him a drunkard because he hung out with them so much. So I'm just kind of trying to be like Jesus and be culturally relevant. And I just want to remind you today that there is a huge difference between being culturally relevant and being culturally compromised. And many Christians find themselves culturally compromised, where you follow the ways of the culture rather than following the ways of Christ. And if you're here today and you're just struggling with that, you're in a good place and scripture is going to speak to your heart this morning. And here's my prayer, church, here's my prayer, is that you would, for the next 30 minutes, that you would open up your heart to the Lord and say, all right, Lord, evaluate me, like search my life and see, is there ways in which I am compromised? Is there any chameleon ways in me where I do kind of, I kind of shift, I kind of change colors, I, I try to fit, rather than following the ways of Christ, I follow the ways of the culture? I want you to ask the Lord that as we go through. Who is shaping you more, the culture or Christ? That's what I want you to kind of put on the table and let the Lord speak to you through his word for the next 30 minutes. So um, Ephesians chapter 4 is where we left off, verse 16. I'm in verse 17. A lot to cover. Here we go. Verse 17, the Apostle Paul says this, Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thoughts. So Paul picks right up where we left off last week in verse 16. He, he drops another therefore on us. We opened up last week with a therefore. Here's another therefore. We said last week, anytime you're reading scripture and you read a therefore, you ask yourself, what's it, what's it there for, right? And so he's referring back to the earlier things that he said about how it is that you and I should be living the Christian life. Remember, we said chapter 4 starts the very practical part of the book of Ephesians. You're going to see lots of commands, lots of instructions, lots of principles today of what you and I should do and shouldn't do. Because he's going to tell us how to walk, how to walk the Christian life. And the first thing he says in how to walk the Christian life is don't walk like the Gentiles. You're like, well, what, do you, what do you mean the Gentiles? Well, when, when, when he uses the word Gentiles here, he's, it's the idea of of pagans, right? It's the idea of those of the world. It's the idea of those who aren't following Christ, those who are not with Christ. And so here's what he's saying. There are two different walks that you can walk in the world. You can walk 
the path of the world. That's the path of the Gentiles. That's, that's the ungodly walk. You can walk that walk or you can walk the walk of Christ. Listen to me. You can't walk both. Don't fool yourselves into thinking that you can straddle the road and you can walk both. And so the Apostle Paul starts off by talking about not walking the walk of the Gentiles. They are two totally different walks. You can walk the walk of the world. You can walk the walk of Christ. But you need to know they're going in opposite directions. And there's opposite principles on those walks, opposite behaviors. They just are completely opposite. He's going to go on, and he's going to, um, you're going to see as we do this that he's going to use a lot of words that have to do with our thinking, right? And he's going, to, he's going to help us understand that the way you live your life really starts with what you think about life is about. And so he, he starts right here. He says, don't walk the way the Gentiles do in the futility of their thoughts. There's the first thinking word, thoughts, the futility of their thoughts, right? Um, scripture is going to tell us a lot about our thinking, the way we think and what we think, and that our minds are not neutral. Um, and so how we walk starts with what we think. And here's the first thing that the Bible says about the old, the, the walk of the world, is that that way of thinking and that way of living is futile. You know what futile means? It's pointless. It's unsatisfactory. Um, it, it's, it's without meaning. Futile. That's, that's the walk of the world. You know where it leads? Nowhere. The walk of the world leads nowhere. It leaves you empty. It, it, we're going to see it promises a lot, but in the end, it's futile, right? It's pointless. It doesn't go anywhere. And so then he's going to go on and describe, hey, listen, if you walk this walk, the people that walk the walk of the world, here's what he says, verse 18. They're darkened in their, here's another mind word, in their what? Darkened in their understanding. In, in, in what you understand about life and how life should work, your thinking is darkened, he, Paul says. They are excluded from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance that is in them. Why? Because of the hardness of their hearts. Let's unpack this verse a little bit right here. Darkened in their understanding and ignorant. That's what scripture says. That's what a life that has excluded itself from God is described as. Again, you notice the, the thinking terms here. Darkened in their understanding. Ignorance, right? And so this is why there can be people in the world that are brilliant, like absolutely brilliant, but they're spiritually darkened. They're spiritually ignorant. They think that we are fools and ignorant, but scripture says, God says, no, no, they're the ones that are darkened. And you can take a, a brilliant scientist like Richard Dawkins, who says just ignorant things like this in his book, The God Delusion. I've described atonement the central doctrine of Christianity. If you don't know what the atonement is, the atonement is the fact that you and I are sinners and Christ came into the world and died for our sins to atone for or pay for our sins, right? I mean, that's the basic tenet of Christianity. And this is what he says. He says, I've described atonement, the central doctrine of Christianity as vicious, sadomasochistic, and repellent. We should also dismiss it as barking mad. And then in his reason rally in 2012, he said these words, I don't despise religious people. I despise what they stand for. What is that? It's ignorant. It's a darkened heart. It's like, well, how, how, do you, how do you get there? Let's go back to verse 18. Here's what it says. They're dark, darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. How do you get a hardened heart? Right? Think of the idea of a, a callus that's formed. Right? How do you get a callus? How do you get a callus on your hand? 
uh, work, right? So I said work, right? I said do work, right? Um, you, you, do, you do the same thing all the time, the same motion, right? It, it forms a hardening of the skin, a repetitive motion, right? Um, in a couple months, all you pumpkin spice people will be happy because all of the, everything green will die in the season, the fall. I don't know why you love this season. Everything dies. And then, and then you have to, you have to rake the leaves. Right now, if, you're, if your hands are soft and you've got computer hands and you don't wear gloves, right, the next day you're going to end up with blisters and calluses, right? It's a hardening of the skin from repeated motion. And what Scripture says is that that happens to some people's hearts. It's a repeat of motion of, of denying God, denying Christ, saying no to truth. I don't want to see. I don't want to hear. No, no, no. And continually going this, and it forms a callus on their heart where your heart gets hardened to the things of God. And the things of the world seem very beautiful, and the things of God seem very dumb. And Paul actually goes on and uses this word callous. Look at the next verse, verse 19. They became callous. And they gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. Does that verse not completely describe our world and culture today? You know, you watch the news and you're like, how did we get here? Like, how, how did this happen? You want to know how it happened? We have a world and a culture that has hardened its heart against God. And so they have this callous that this forms on your heart. You're watching, you see evil and wickedness, and you're like, how could somebody do that? How could somebody do that? To somebody, how could that happen? It's a hardening of the heart that has happened to people that repeatedly say no to God. Now, it would be easy, but it would be a huge mistake to just think, well, that's like an out there problem. <laughs> Thank goodness we don't have that problem in here. That's an out there problem. And let us not be so foolish, church, to think that we don't have that same problem. That there's not calluses that form on our hearts towards God and the things of God. I mean, there's certain areas that we'll let God in our life, but then there's certain areas that we've just hardened our hearts towards God as well. We ourselves, we can get desensitized. You're living in this world. We can get desensitized. You know how you get desensitized? Just a little bit at a time. Just a little bit at a time. And that's how you get a callous on your heart towards the things of God. And so what, what Paul has described here in these opening couple of verses is, is basically um, the progressive nature of how sin works and and ultimately leads towards rebellion to God. He's just described it. Let me let me let me list it for you. The progressive stages of sin and, and how it you end up getting to where we're at. First it starts with the stubborn hardening of your heart. No, I don't want to change. No, I want to do what I want to do. No, I, I I'm not believing God for that. No, no, no. Right? A hardening of your heart, which then leads to personal ignorance of God. We're like, you don't, you don't know God, you don't trust God, you don't believe God. It's, it's, it's just ignorance. The word ignorance is the word knowledge with the word, with the prefix A in front of it, which makes it negative. It means without knowledge. I, 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 I don't have knowledge of who God is. When you don't know who God is, it leads to then this just darkened understanding, Right? This, this darkened thinking of life and what's the world about and what's okay and what's not okay and, and what's right and wrong. How do we even, we're just darkened in our understanding. And when you have a darkened understanding, it's just one step away from leading an evil and wicked behavior type life that ends up wanting more and more. It's a very slippery slope. This path is a downhill path that the world is on. And so Paul is going to turn around. And, and he's going to speak to the church now, and he's going to, that whole way of life, this whole path, he's going to say, that's not your path. That's not the way you and I should be living. And he's going to turn, and he's going to now point us towards the path of Christ. And he says this in verse 20, that's not how you came to know Christ. Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in him. 
right? So this, this Greek word for the word assuming, it, it carries with it the idea of since. You know, that's not the way you came to know Christ since you've heard about him and you've come to know him and you know that the truth is in him, right? Since you've done that. He is the way. He is the truth. And if this is the way and this is the truth, then this can't be the way and this can't be the truth because it's the complete opposite of the way of Christ. Another interesting side note here in verses 20 and 21 is that it's the only time in Ephesians that Paul calls Jesus, Jesus. Every other time he's talking about Christ, he uses the word Christ, which is, is not Jesus' last name, right? You know, that's not Jesus' last name. Christ is a, is a, is a title. Christ is a title. Um, in, in both in Greek, the Greek word is Christ. The Hebrew word is Messiah. They both mean the same thing. It means the anointed one. Uh, the Savior, the Messiah, the Deliverer, right? That's who Jesus is. It speaks to his position. It speaks to his, his title, his power. And so as we've been going through Ephesians, Paul uses the word Christ, 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 talking about the position and the power of, of, of Christ. But now he's going to start talking about walking this path. And so he uses the personal name of Jesus, Jesus, the man who took on flesh and lived on this earth and says to us, be like Jesus. Walk like Jesus walked while he was on this earth. Right? That's what most scholars believe. That's why he pivoted and used the name Jesus because he's going to pivot now in his writings and give us very practical commands how to walk like Jesus. You and I can't walk like the Christ. I mean, we're not, we're not the Messiah. We're not the anointed one. We, but, but, we, but Jesus, the man... That's our model. That's our example. That's who we follow. And so he's going he's gonna to give us a bunch of practical commands. And he starts off before he gives the practical commands by using an analogy that all of us will understand. And he uses the analogy of saying, you got to take off your dirty clothes and you don't go back to your dirty clothes and you got to put on your new clean clothes. And that's what he says next in verse 22. He says this, he says, take off your former way of life. Take off the way of living in your BC days. You know, your, before you knew Christ, before Jesus was in your life, and you walked this path, he's like, you got to take that way of life off. That way of life, the old self, is corrupted by deceitful desires. And, and, and be renewed in the spirit of your... Your what? Minds. I'm telling you, the thinking thing is a, is a big thing. We'll come back to that. Push pause on the mind thing. We'll come back to thinking. Let's, let's talk about two of the other words that are here. Let's talk about deceitful desires. The old life, the old self, this path, is, it's corrupt. And it's corrupted by deceitful desires. Now, why does he use the word deceitful in front of desires? Right? Because on this path, this path is full of desires. You, you live the way you want. You live for yourself. If it feels good, do it. Right? You live your life and just enjoy it. And, and like, that's the desires of this life. And live life on this path, except those are deceitful desires. They don't ultimately deliver what they promise. They promise joy. They promise satisfaction. Listen to me. Students, listen to me. The world's path looks very attractive. Its desires temporarily feel good, look good, smell good, taste good, but they're deceitful. Why are they deceitful? Because they leave you empty at the end. They promise you everything, and then it leaves you empty. And if you don't believe me, I got about 50 people in this church that I know would talk to you that say, I've been down that path. I walked down this path. I lived, I was the master of this path. And it left me empty. And I'll let them tell you the stories of what, don't be so ignorant to think, well, that's not me. I can go down this path. No, 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 no. Parents used to say, you don't have to stick your head in the sewer to know that it stinks. This path stinks. 
It's got deceitful desire. I'm telling you, the desires, they seem good. And everybody else is going to be on this path. But it's corrupt. And it, it's deceitful. Like even right now, listen to me. Everybody, even right now, think. Have I bought in to any of these deceitful desires? Is there any way that I've been living this path, chasing this dream, thinking this is what life is about? Am I deceived right now? It's how we're going to end our time today. We're going to end with just asking God to reveal you to you so that you might even know if you're deceived here today. And then he says this, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Let's talk about, let's talk about the mind here a little bit. This is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I think it's important because this whole passage is really anchored in the truth that it starts with your thinking. And let me tell you something very important. Don't miss this, please. The reason why many of us cannot change our behavior is because we haven't changed our thinking. We haven't changed our minds. And you're trying to live a somewhat moralistic, religious spiritual life, trying to kind of do some of the things God's way, but you haven't changed your mind yet. You haven't renewed your mind. You're like, what are you talking about, renewing your mind, changing your thinking? Because the way you live starts with the way you think. You are where you are, why you are, because how you've thought about life. And so this is why Scripture says you've got to renew your thinking. You've got to change your mind. You know, actually, the Bible has a very specific word for changing your mind. You all know it. You maybe just didn't know it. You didn't know you know it. You know what the word is for changing your mind? Repentance. Repent. The word repent means to change your mind. You're like, I thought repent just meant like I'm sorry. No, 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 no. It's so much deeper than that. Repent means not that I'm sorry. It means that, wow, I recognize what I did is wrong. I recognize why I did is wrong, and I'm turning from that wrong, and I'm changing my thinking about even what I should be doing and why I did, and I'm going the opposite direction. That's what the Greek word is. Let me tell you about the Greek. The Greek word is metanoia. It's, it's made up of two words. It's a compound word, metanoia. It means to repent in the Bible, but really what meta means is to change, and noia is the word for mind. It literally means to change your mind. And some of you, you're trying to change your behavior without changing your mind about what life is about and the purpose of your direction and what should guide your life and who is God and what part does God want to play in your life and what does it look like to live for God. And some of you are trying to do it apart from changing your mind about all these things about God. And it'll never work. That's why it starts with repentance. You know what? You and I need to repent every day. We need to live in repentance. Continually change your thinking. This is going to bring me happiness. This is going to bring me joy. This is what life, this is where everyone else is going. Wait a minute. Let me see. No, I got to change my thinking. This is not what life is about. This is not going to bring me ultimate happiness. This is, this is another one of those deceitful desires we talked about on Sunday. I'm not going to be deceived. I'm going to change. This is the way to go. That's repentance. And you and I need to live in repentance all the time. When you do that, Paul says this, verse 24. It's like, it's like putting on a new self. You take off the old life. You take off the old dirty clothes. You don't get up and put on your old dirty clothes again. Most of you, right? You don't do that again. We got that chair where they're like half dirty in our bedroom. We're like, they, some, all right, but, but assuming they're dirty, dirty, right? They, you guys have that chair too? You got that? <laughs> Treadmill, whatever you got. You got. <clears throat> Fully dirty. Take them off, and I'm not putting them back on. This is what Paul says. You put on the new self. The one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. That's the life for the child of God. Not this old life, this new life. Put on these new clothes. And now Paul's going to tell you how to do it. And he's going to give a bunch of commands. All right? And as we go through these commands, listen to me. There's going to be nothing confusing about these commands. None of you are going to go walk out and be like, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't follow what Joe's saying today about those commands. They're, they're going to be really simple commands. 
And it'd be really simple to be like, yeah, I don't do any of that stuff. And so here's where I'm asking you, open your heart and be like, and this is how we're going to end. Am I doing any of this stuff? This is what it means to walk on this new path. Verse 25, here's the first thing he says. Therefore, put away lying. Speak the truth. Each one to his neighbor because we're members of one another. Here's the first thing he says. If you're going to walk this new path, he just says, just be honest. Stop lying. And he says, stop lying to one another. And he says, stop lying to one another because we're members of one another. You're like, what do you mean members of one another? Well, he's pulling on this imagery of the church being a body again. And so my hand is a member of my shoulder, is a member of my ear, all members of one body. My hand needs to tell my shoulder the truth about, right? If my hand's lying about the reality of its situation, it's going to affect the rest of my body. And this is what Paul's saying. Just be honest. Just be an honest person. Stop lying. Build one another up, right? You're like, yeah, but what about, what about just little ones? Like some people, they, like, I, I, you know, and it's like, yeah, people are hard and people are difficult. And some people really frustrate us and make us angry. Paul's like, oh, anger. Great. Let's talk about that next. Next verse, verse 26. It's what he says. Be angry. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And don't give the devil an opportunity. Let's talk about anger a little bit. This is important. Some of you are relieved to know that being angry in and of itself is not a sin. Some of you are like, great, finally, I, <laughs> I knew it. I knew I wasn't sinning. No. <laughs> There's two clarifications, though, that Paul gives. The first is, in your anger, do not sin. Okay, so here's the first clarification. It's what you do with your anger that determines whether it's right or wrong. Being angry, like, we, we should be angry at certain things, right? It, we're, anger is just an emotion that lets you know something's going on in here. And so we should be angry at unrighteousness. There should be, there's such a thing as righteous anger. When things are wrong against God and the ways of God, it should stir up anger in us like that's not right. Now, Paul says, now how do you handle that anger? becomes right or wrong. And what he says is, in your anger, don't sin. So it's like you don't rage back. You don't lash back. You don't attack back. You, you don't start punching the dashboard of your car, right? You don't flip out. You don't lose it. That's when your anger now all of a sudden becomes sin, and you've lost your temper. And that is not the way of Christ on the Christ-like path. That's the way old you would have handled it. But now he says, number one, in your anger, don't sin. And the second thing he does, he does is he puts a time period on. He says, you shouldn't live in anger. Right? So like some of you, on a scale of one to ten, like you just, you live at an eight and a half. <laughs> and you're, it's just always right there. And it's and it's, it's always ready to come out. And the Bible says, no, 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 you shouldn't live in anger. In other words, deal with it. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Here's why. If you don't do these two things, if you don't handle your anger rightly or you stay in anger, the Bible says you actually give the devil an opportunity. The word there is actually the word foothold. It's the idea that you've opened up the front door of your house and you've given the devil an invitation to come in and be a part of your life because you're staying in sin. Sin is darkness and the enemy traffics in darkness. He looks for darkness to come and make his home. And so when your life is one that is an open door for darkness, you're giving the devil an opportunity. You can't figure out why you can't shake this thing, why you can't change. Here's why. Because you've opened the door for the enemy to come in. You've got to close the door to your life. This is one of the things Paul says, don't stay angry. Here's the next thing he says, verse 28. And then he says, let the thief no longer steal. So he's say, look, be honest. Don't lie to each other. Don't be angry. And then he says, don't steal. Instead, He's to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. 
don't, don't, don't be a thief. Don't steal. And then before you go, all right, well, that, one, that one's not an issue. Let's just make sure. Let me ask you a couple questions. You ever conveniently forgotten to return something that you borrowed that you really like? Oh, that just got awkwardly silent. <laughs> you ever slightly overcharged a client? You ever falsely claimed expenses? You ever fudged on your taxes? You know, just, just a little bit? But with the understanding that they just don't know how to manage money anyway, and so I'm just, I'm much better at managing my money than, right? Paul calls us... Paul calls us to honesty. Scripture, be honest, be honest. Don't, don't be a, a taker. Don't take what's not belonging to you. And here's what he says. Basically, he says, instead, do honest work. Like, just be an honest person in the way that you live life. Do, he actually says, do honest work with your own hands. So in other words, it's like, hey, don't, be, don't steal. Here, here's, the, here's the JLT translation, Joe's loose translation, basically. Here's what he's, here's what he's saying. Get a job. That's what he's saying. That's what he's like. Don't be a thief. Work. Get a job. Get a job with your hands. Listen, young people, there's nothing wrong with working a job with your hands and making an honest living. And stop believing the, the idea that, you know, through social, you're going to be the next influencer on social media and you're going to blow up and that's how you're going to get rich and you're going to make millions. Like that and do it, right? And, and I get it. Like, I'm not going to look over here because I've been, I've been told I'm old and it's different now. It's different nowadays. And, it's a, and I don't want to kill dreams, but maybe just get a job while you're dreaming, all right? And, and then, and then, no, that's, that's, it's not towards my kids. They both have jobs. They're both working very hard. That's to other people's kids out there. Out there. Or if you're 40 and you're still living at home, it's, I go. All right, so verse, verse 31. Let's wrap this thing up. <laughs> We're going to skip verse, wait. We've got to do 29. We can't skip 29 because this is important. Here's another one. What's it look like to walk this path? Be honest. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't be angry. Verse 29, watch your mouth. No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. The word foul language there in, in the Greek, it's the word for rotten. It was used of fruit that spoiled. Just with the, 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 the potty talk, the rotten language, right? The foul language. This is what Paul said. It should be language when you walk on this path. It's the language of Christ. It'd be the language that you have God in you that comes out of you. And so the words that you say, listen, words have power. There's a whole chapter in the Bible in James chapter 3 about the power of our tongue and how it can either bring death or bring life. And this is what Paul's saying. Your words should give grace to those who hear. It shouldn't be rotten. It shouldn't be spoiled, filthy, rotten words coming out of the child of God's mouth. Watch your language, he says. Now we'll skip 30, and we'll get to verse 31. And then he just sums it all up with these five or six things. He says, so let all bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, slander be removed from you. That's the old dirty clothes. Get those things off of you, out of your life, along with malice. Right? These are all words that are driven towards others, the way that you treat others. Right? They're things that can be in you that comes out of you towards others. And he's saying when you walk this path, the way you treat others should be Christ-like. Get rid of these things, he says. This is a problem. What would it look like? Bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, slander. What would it look like for the next two and a half months in this political season to just do this verse? Now you've taken it too far. <laughs> it was cool when you were busting on the kids, but now it's too verse. Verse 32, be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God forgave you in Christ. Be kind, okay. Be compassionate, okay. Forgive. 
uh uh-uh. I can't, I can't forgive what he did. I'll never forgive what she did. This is, this is the path of Christ. No, no, you don't know what they did. I don't, he does. Listen to me. One of the most Christ-like things you could do is to forgive the one who has wounded you. As Jesus was literally being nailed to the cross, he said the words, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah, but they never even asked for forgiveness. Doesn't matter. Yeah, but if I forgive them, then I give them the power back. Scripture doesn't say that. Yeah, but they don't even know. They don't even know what they did. They don't even know how it hurt me. They don't even know the years of misery that I've carried this burden. Scripture gives no qualifications to offering forgiveness. Why? Because God offers no qualifications to the forgiveness he offers you. Aren't you glad that you're forgiven no matter what? So God turns around and says, okay, so you've got to do the same thing. What I've done for you, you've got to do. It is one of the most Christ-like things you will do is forgive somebody. And then the last verse, and we're done, friends. But we're going to pray. We're going to pray together, which I think is the most important part. So stay with me, please. This last verse, Paul puts right in the middle of all these commands of do's and don'ts. And here's what he puts right in the middle. Hey, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who, where's the Holy Spirit? He's in you. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. So in other words, the Holy Spirit that lives within you, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. The word grieve is the word grieve. It's the word that was used of of mourning, a funeral, when you lose a loved one. And the pain and the sadness that comes in this grieving at, at the loss of something, the Bible says that's what happens to the Holy Spirit when you and I stray off this path and we go back to this way. The Holy Spirit goes, no, Joe, no, 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 no. Don't, don't turn back. Oh, no. It grieves God. It hurts God. It doesn't say it angers him. It doesn't say he turns his back on you. It doesn't say he doesn't forgive you. It doesn't say he's disappointed in you. It doesn't say that you're a spiritual failure. It says it just grieves him. Think about that in the choices that you're making. Are you just making God's, oh, that grieves the Holy Spirit within you. And so God's heart, is not for his kids to be chameleon Christians. We come here at church and we act one way and we sing songs and we're with the people of God and the family of God and the house of God and then we go out into the wild and then we just start blending in. We put our old dirty clothes on and we just start acting this way, lying and stealing and cheating and cursing and living that way and doing whatever we want, living this way, chasing the American dream, thinking it's all about that and then Sunday comes and God's like, no, no, no. So, let's ask God if there's any of this stuff in us. If you're new, sometimes we close services like this. We believe God's real, and we believe God wants to speak to your heart. So we're going to pray, and we're going to ask God to bring things to mind. And if he does, listen to me, friends, confess them, and then repent of them. Ask God to change your mind. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to guide you. And I'm going to stay focused. Five minutes. We're done. Five minutes. Okay? This is the most important five minutes of the the sermon right here where we're going to let God speak. I'm done speaking. Let's let God speak now. Go ahead and close your eyes. Bow your heads. Here's the first thing I want you to pray. God, help me to hear you only. God, help me just to hear you only. I'm just going to go through the list of things that the scripture said. Here's the first one. God, do I lie? God, am I a dishonest person? Do I fudge? Do I tell white lies? God, 
will you show me if there's dishonest ways within me? God brings something to mind. Just confess it. And then I want you to ask God uh, just a follow-up question. Say, God, why? Why am I dishonest at times? Why do I lie? Why do I do that? Let's go on to the next one. God, is there any ways in which I, I've stolen? God, is there any ways in which I'm dishonest? I've taken things that don't belong to me? God, what do you want me to do about that? God, how's my language? God, do I, do I speak rotten words? Are my words the kind of words that a child of God should be speaking? Lord, am I an angry person? Do I have anger issues? Do I have unresolved anger issues? Do I walk around just at an eight and a half angry all the time? God, would you show me if I'm angry? Why am I angry? What am I holding on to that is causing this anger? Okay, we're going to do two more before I do this next one. I just would ask, give me your eyes just for a second, church. When I talk about forgiveness, forgiveness is trusting God in handling the offense. Trusting God to handle the offender. Here's what you need to know. God sees all, and he knows all, and there's one judge in the world, and it's him. 
And so forgiveness is trusting the God who sees all and knows all and knows exactly what happened. It's trusting him for the consequences and you releasing that. That's forget. It's not holding on to it. It's not you being the avenger. It's not you being judge. That will cause bitterness to well up inside and like a poison, it will kill you from the inside out. And so before we do forgiveness right now, I want you to have a biblical picture of forgiveness. It's trusting God to do his job and letting go and trusting him. So let's go back and let's ask the Lord. Father, is there anybody that I need to forgive right now? God, bring somebody to mind. Would you release them to God? Would you forgive them? Say that to God. Say, God, I forgive them. God, help me to release this bitterness. And then lastly, when it just comes to our thinking, would you just ask God, just ask him, God, is there anything about my thinking about life and about the purpose of life and the goals of life and my relationships and my time and my energy and my money. Is, is there anything at all about my thinking that you want to correct? God, I, I'm so thankful that you don't call us to perfection. I thank you, God, that even though I, I know I'm going to fall short, I'm going to fall short today, that your grace, your grace just covers over my shortcomings. And so, God, we pray, though, that we would live and walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling. Father, I pray that you'd help us to say no to the old path and yes to the new path. God, I pray that you continue to speak to us. Give us insight as to why we do the things that we should not do. And thank you for the Holy Spirit that helps us to be holy. Help us to learn, to lean on him, and to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, God, we love you, and we thank you for Jesus. And we pray these things in his name.